Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pikulski. I absolutely love what I do. I'm so grateful to meet amazing people literally every single day who blow my mind that listen to this podcast. So thank you, each and every one of you guys, for being here, for allowing me to do this and, and reach as many as, of you as I possibly can with this incredible message to live your greatest life. And we're all on a path. We're all on a journey. And today's guest is absolute gem. He is a 11-year Navy SEAL, literal trained warrior, one of the top warriors in the entire world, one of the greatest warriors perhaps to ever walk the face of the planet are these Navy SEALs. And after 11 years, decided he was going to leave the service and reimmerse himself into society. And the level of struggle that these men go through is beyond comprehension. And Jeff Nichols joins me today to talk about that, to talk about how he was able to transition his life and how he's now set this very clear, concise mission to empower all ex-military, professional athletes, even CEOs to ultimately transition out of this very particular lifestyle that they live into one that allows them to be happy and fulfilled and ultimately love. And I think Jeff and I are, are kindred souls here. We have very parallel missions on this planet. It's an absolute honor and privilege to have him on. He lets us know he's a listener of the podcast and, and that of itself is just amazing to hear. I'm so grateful for that. I got to meet one of his friends today, actually in Bali, ironically enough, I'm walking down the road, decide to randomly stop in and do a yoga class at a place on the side of the road. And of course, I run into somebody there who listens to the podcast and happened to be one of Jeff's friends. So shout out to Brian. It's just amazing the people we're touching with this podcast. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for putting your trust in me and in this team and this mission. And we will continue to evolve the mission and clarify this mission for you and everybody. And it's all framed around the six pillars of a lean, healthy, muscular physique. And if you guys don't know where that came from, it's really quite simple. And it's really, you know, there's really only six things as human beings we can control. I think, you know, maybe there's someone who's going to tell me I'm missing something, but there's six things we can control. It's how we move, how we breathe, how we think, how we eat, how we sleep, and the environment in which we do them. And the environment is encompassing of the light and the air and the sound and the EMF and the people. And so it's really six things we can control. So that's where that came from. There's only six inputs. So you learn to realize it's really quite simple. You can maybe start to grasp how to make changes for your life and take control of the one single thing right now that's holding you back. And you know, we all go through seasons of life. And I hope each and every one of you acknowledge that sometimes the struggles in life are necessary part of growth. And Jeff Nichols, our guest today, talks a lot about the struggles that he's gone through and the growth that he's faced. He's certainly done more growing than most people will do in 10 lifetimes. And there's a lot of lessons to be garnered here. So I hope you enjoy this podcast with Jeff Nichols. Today's podcast is brought to you by Bubs Naturals. Why it's an absolutely perfect fit because if you guys don't know the story of Bubs, Bub is actually a special forces serviceman as well who didn't make it out. And two of his best friends decided they wanted to start something in his name and honor his mission and his legacy. And 10% of all profits from Bubs go to charity to support I don't even want to say, I don't even know, to be honest, I don't want to misquote it, but certainly to help underprivileged people, people who just don't have everything they need. And on top of that, they're going to give you 20% off today because you're amazing and Bubs is amazing. And for people that don't know Bubs, Bubs sells two products and, and two products only and two of the best products that I literally use every day. They were so gracious to send me boxes over here to Australia and Bali. So MCT powder is something I put in my coffee every day. It replaces almond milk and it replaces typical milk and makes it super creamy and delicious and also gives you it added brain power. So I love putting MCT in my coffee and this one dissolves really well. I know I've advocated MCT powder in your coffee before, but if you just buy it off the shelf in any store and put it in your coffee, it just sits like a big clump on top. This one dissolves really easily and really effectively, makes the coffee super creamy and delicious. And then collagen powder, I suggest everyone who eats meat 
take collagen powder as a necessary prerequisite to getting additional glycine into your diet. Obviously, as humans, we ate entire animals. It wasn't just muscle meat. So there's tendons and ligaments and fascia and, and organ meats. And those things have very different ratios of you know, amino acids and nutrients. So if we don't get those things in, we're not complete and we end up having certain systems in our body that are underperforming. So bubsnaturals.com and use the code intelligence to get 20% off. And I hope you absolutely love this podcast with Jeff Nichols. And if you do go over to Instagram right now, give him a follow at Jeff CSCS and tell him he's awesome because he'll appreciate your words. And I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, guys. Have an amazing day. Enjoy the show. Hey everybody, I'm sitting here in amazing Bali and get this incredible opportunity to chat for the last 40 minutes with Jeff Nichols. Jeff, welcome to the show. Super grateful to have you on and to have spent the last 40 minutes talking even though we should have recorded it. Yeah, I really I really appreciate it. Unfortunately, I'm not sitting in Bali, although <laughs> it definitely has its times where it's beautiful. Today being an overcast day is not one of those. And I think every day, like, and I, I talk about this on the podcast a lot is people say, oh, it's raining today or oh, it's cold. I'm like, man, you woke up and, and you feel this brother. Like you, you and I come from this from the same perspective. It's like, and my heart beats in my chest and my eyes open and my brain works and I have all my limbs and I'm still here and I get to kiss my family one more time. And, you know, that's just so amazing. And as long as I can say that every day, regardless of the weather is you'll never hear me complain about it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, there's a lot of other places I would rather not be <laughs> for sure. And yeah, and I think that's a big, been a big change too, is yeah, the last couple of years getting out of bed and, and looking forward to it. Being conscious of that has, has been extremely helpful for me. Yeah. You're 11 years in the Navy. I'm sure a lot of your friends didn't make it back. No, I, yeah, I had, I think in my tenure at the place that I was at, there was 29 funerals that I attended. I think it's funny because I not it's not funny in that regard, but just the place I'm at in my life. It's not that I have any regrets towards any of that that sort of stuff, but it's interesting how the place that I was at, how fragile life can be, but how how resilient it can be, and be kind of happening at the same time. But you know, the, the funerals are one of those things that what an interesting sort of perspective gained when going through you know going through funerals back in that time. You know, it, it really. I wonder, I wonder how I would approach that emotionally currently, you know, because a lot of it was, you know, emotion in, but no emotion out. And now I'm very, very much a proponent of emotion out as well. Yeah. I think as a young alpha or aspiring alpha or alpha male, emotions are sometimes just dissuaded or, or disregarded. And, you know, I live that life for a long time. It's like, you just don't have to share your emotions. You're not encouraged to share your emotions. And, and now, again, maybe you and I are on a similar path with this. Is like just this reality of like being secure enough in your sexuality, your direction, your objective in life to be able to be authentic and share whatever emotions come up and allow that, allowing those things to express. I think first of all allows other people the permission to express their own emotions, but also allows you to explore the reality of both sides of your darkness and your light. And I think this necessity of achieving more light, which seems to be the objective in life by necessity, you know, requires you to explore the darkness and I think that's important, man. I think I think sharing those emotions, whether in darkness is obviously a generic broad term, but this idea of emotions that maybe we're not encouraged to share in youth and, and sadness and fear and anxiety and vulnerability almost is like seems to be the only way to, or at least not the only way, but a necessary component of exploring the other end of it, right? The other end of the spectrum being the happiness, the joy, the love, the light. Is that something you agree with? Yeah, I think, and you said it already, like, the, I think the key term for me that it really stands out for that is vulnerability. Understand that when I, when I gained it, I'm certain I gained, I've gained that, uh, the perspective of what real vulnerability can do for me from a positive standpoint. And, and that's directly in lieu of my time. And really in the last year or so, really learning about meditation and prior to that, but really was my catalyst was the psychedelics. 
the treatments that I've gone through with my traumatic brain injuries and whatnot. And, you know, vulnerability is one of those things that, you know, when I first began understanding vulnerability and its value or where it scared the, scared the hell out of me for a while was that I kind of put two people in, in two different, I put people in two different categories here. So you had subjective emotion or objective emotion. And I always perceive subjective people as being weak, right? Objective people like authoritarian, do this, do it now, do what I say, go do it, get it done. Objectivity to me tend to exude strength. And now I, I think it's completely opposite. I think that a person that has true strength is able to show vulnerability and compassion for anyone, really, you know, to some degree or any population or any gender or any sexual orientation, whatever, whatever it may be. I think that a person's ability to show true vulnerability actually empowers them. Right? I, I feel that having the capacity to show yourself to be vulnerable and accepting of it makes you essentially a more effective hunter, if you will, if you're an active duty personnel, firefighter, or police officer in that tactical space. I think that if you're able to truly express vulnerability to the people that you love, that your capacity to actually do violent in, in order to protect others, right? It's the conversation of sheep, dog, wolf, all that good stuff. Like I really feel like I did. I had a real capacity for violence, an extremely, extremely well-taught one, well-versed uh, capacity for violence in my previous job. And it was necessary. I don't say that as sense of like, oh my God, I had, yes, I was an extremely violent person. I'm so thankful that I am and was. Because it protected me, it saved me. But what it did on the emotional side, I had a really hard time coming off that gas pedal. And you know, from a coach now, as an exercise physiologist and a coach, and that's what I teach. I teach that that those those individuals in active duty and going into selection processes across the military space. It's made me such a better coach because it wasn't about hey, you're not doing what I'm doing. Like I was able to really remember my process. In the path that I was going, like I was able to actually step out of my shoes and be empathetic for these individuals because Jeff Nichols at 22 going through that selection process, and I was like, I'm not as charismatic and, and confident as I am currently, right? So, man, like I, I just, it gets me really, really excited when I see people now in the tactical space veterans or otherwise in the sports space in, 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 when I listen to you and, and Gus on your podcast that so many of them are they're unapologetic about what they're doing because they're certain they're in, they're impacting people subjectively right and I think that it's a beautiful thing now that we have to look inward now in sport because outward in sport and the tactical space is really it's not that there's not constant refinement in it but man when people make the change on the inside in that tactical space, man, are they more capable, you know, in the outward expression of their job and performance. So, like, I get really excited about it because then I not only see these people that are extremely violent, but they're genuinely kind and happy, which is a bit, a bit of a conundrum to me, you know, looking back at myself because I was not a happy and I was not a kind human being. And now I'm, I'm very proudly very, very proudly say, yeah, it may look a certain way, but I consider myself an incredibly compassionate person now. Do you think it was necessary for you to go through that emotionless time, the struggle, in order for you to see the benefit of the vulnerability? Or do you think someone in your place at 22 or 25 years old could have become aware of this necessity of vulnerability and actually still live the life you lived? That is a million dollar question, right? I depends on the mood I'm in. <laughs> I'm, I'm being asked that question because I've been asked that a couple of times. I think that the answer to that now for me is, man, Ben, I, I really don't think so. Like maybe it's me. I'm talking, I'm talking about me. A very, very good friend of mine, Nick Kumalatsos, the former Marine Corps Raider, he and I talk about this. And we met each other at this time, this really awful angst driven time when we separated from military. And that is what our friendship has kind of been bonded on. And, you know, he's gone through his, his treatments and man, like what a caring, loving human being he is now. Not that he wasn't, but it's become that. And I guess my point is, is that he and I talked about this and I really don't think so. And I mean this in the sense of, I don't think that that was my purpose on this planet. I don't feel like 
I was supposed to be that subjective human being in that objective world. I think that, you know, if you look back, if you start reading a lot about like how the transition was for the samurai and some of the Viking classes and even some of the real traditional warrior classes, that transition back into the community was something that was known amongst the entire community. And that entire community knew their part in reassimilating those warriors back. I think that that's largely in part what's missing. And, that, and, that's, and I think that that's where us as veterans come. I don't think it's the government's job to do the transition. I don't think that, number one, they're not equipped to. Number one, it's not really their job. It's not why people join the military. Like, I joined the military in a time of war. Like, there shouldn't be any confusion as to what I was do- wanting to go do, right? And there is people that join, like, I joined for college. I'm like, well, then you, you should have gone somewhere else. You know, so I think that I don't have a lot of empathy in the sense of judgmental empathy for myself back then because i know i really deep down feel like i needed to create that external sort of hard shell if you want to call that that artificiality that armor i hate to use the metaphors but that's just kind of what it felt like it i needed to be that person to handle that load that i chose and again to be very clear with my words i chose i volunteered i did all these things and so now i feel very responsible now to share that message of, yep, you did this, you chose it. But now you have to find resources to take that foot off the gas pedal. Because carrying that heavy weight around when service of that magnitude is no longer necessary, then you're going to start burning the bridges that close to your family. Like for me, whether it was, you know, my addiction to opioids, my womanizing, all those sort of things post service, you know, like, like I lashed out at the world because I didn't have enough conflict, like conflict became this CNS sort of 180, where it actually made me that stress, that extremely, extremely violent nature became parasympathetic, not, and then when stress is then removed in this utopian place we call the United States, like I had to create stress to feel comfortable. And, you know, I I think I needed to be that person. I just, I'm very, very thankful that I have learned from great teachers to teach me how to take my foot off that gas pedal and find love and send the sympathetic nature of the the nervous system. Yeah. And Jeff, I think no one would ever judge you for that decision, right? It's like the position you put yourself into necessitated whatever it took to bring you out alive and, you know, positively accomplishing your missions. And if it's being able to remove yourself from any attachment to emotion, then I think that makes a lot of sense, man. Like if you went in there as a I don't know, vulnerable person, that 1% weakness, that 1% divergence from the, the objective outcome possibly could have taken away your survival instinct. It could have taken away that split second decision that you know, is life or death, man. So in your situation, like you did exactly what you needed to do. It seems to be successful. And, you know, I think you, I'm sure, will call yourself very fortunate to, one, have gone through it, but two, now to see the other side. Because as you know, there's a lot of your fellow special forces and military people who don't get to see the other side, don't get to see the vulnerability or the maybe the benefit of being in touch with, I don't have to be this hard rock shell all the time when I re-immerse into typical culture. Yeah, it- you know, there's a couple things that I've had to put in place in my life. Definitely, I've had to get my life in order for that. There's a lot of things. There's, there's just so much, so much things that I've really have changed in my life for the better in order to get to the place in my life where life matters. And for me, life matters most when you have people that you really are friends. You have friends. And when I knew I was on the path of real healing when I was finding real joy in other people's success. And I had never experienced that before. And then on the other side is, you know, my girlfriend, Catherine right now is like the rock in my life. And not just because of any sort of, you know, coincidental circumstances, because I do not believe in coincidence. You know, the life, the path that she has, you know, taken herself amongst many of the things that have been put into her life as a, as a child and as an adult and changes and, you know, heartbreak and, and all those sort of things. 
you know, finding somebody in your life that truly sees you, like I'm, I'm being air quotes, that sees you. And mm -hmm. she sees me and she's willing to work with change for me, for us. And it's really, really hard. I think it's very hard for people with, you know, high performance background, whatever that means in industry and in, in, in finance and in sport in the military for us to go, you know what, like really the cliche exists, you know, to be a great man, I need a great woman there to support me. And I was the current stage, I guess you want to call it in a relationship that we're in. I've never gotten to this point in a relationship, like a healthy relationship. And so that has also been something now where Man, I'm super thankful because of, you know, being mindful of where I'm at. It's like I, I can only grow so much as a person until me personally I find somebody that I deeply love and that loves me back that's outside of my family and friends. So that also has been super beneficial for me is to just I don't have to be, you know, this angry, compulsively like needing some sort of stimulus. You know, I need another per need people in my life. Like I'm fairly introverted at times, but man, like, you know, I, I really like people and I never liked them before, really. So that's been a bit of a change as well. That's awesome. It's funny. I'm, I'm reading a book right now. I don't know if you've, you're a fan of Napoleon Hill, but he's got a, he's got an audio that I recommend to everybody. It's, it's just in your own words or in his own words. And he speaks about how, you know, if you know who he is, but you wrote Think and Grow Rich and as well as a number of other things and became very successful, you know, early in the 19th uh, century or, or sort of in the 1900s, so 1920-ish and beyond. And he speaks about how, you know, the only reason that all of these other people in his era were successful is because they had wives at home who, you know, even when the going got tough, even when everyone else was down, them, even that when they were down, they're like, you know, their biggest supporters, you can do this, you got this, keep going, get out there and keep pushing, don't slow down. And, you know, it seems like that's the order of the day is, you know, all these men who are crushing it have a very supportive spouse behind them. You know, even to look at Jordan Peterson, who I don't know if you follow is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the book that started it all for me. Yeah. Yeah, his thing is like, you know, you need that one relationship, right? And for he's, you know, he says the reason I am the man I am is because I have someone at home who's 100% honest with me. And without that foundation of complete honesty, I have nothing to stand on. And. You know, that just resonates with me so much. It seems like it's hitting home with you as well. Yeah, I think, you know, that what's going on with me is now is like, I have to recognize that what's going on is important, right? This, my ability to share a space with somebody I love, whether it's your children or your wife or, or whatever it may be, learning this whilst maintaining a high level of communication is the challenge. That's the real challenge. And it's such a worthy one, though. So, I'm buckled in and ready for like life for me after 40, really 38 is when like I'm 41 now. 36 is when I pulled my head out of my ass. <laughs> it took me two years to clean off the poo. And about 38 till now is like, it's been a real aggressive, happy climb, you know, including people that I love and that I'm accepting of their love. That's the thing is I always had people that love me and cared for me. And I just, I took it for granted. So no more of that. that. That Jeff Nichols is dead. How important was it for you to have those people that still loved you? Looking back on it, I'm sure at the time you took it for granted, but looking back on it, as far as keeping you grounded and, you know, so I think a lot of men have an issue changing, right? So they have these habits and these characteristics and as much as they consciously want to change, it becomes very hard to outgrow those old bad habits so I'm curious your perspective on that, just this idea of, you know, you have obviously overcome a lot of ingrained necessary habits and maybe even characteristics to transcend, you know, this person that you were in the past to evolve into the man you're becoming now. What were your anchors? Like what, maybe what were those things that you feel like maybe still rear their head a little bit? And what were the anchors that allow you to keep coming back to you know, reminding yourself of the person you're becoming? You know, the first one is, is very obvious, I think, for those of us that are parents. And the, the first one is my son. He's 13 now. And understanding how how impressionable that age is and the fact that I can 
be in this mindset, this conscious, very conscious state of mind. So I can, I can engage with him. I can observe, you know, I can be a big part of his life. And I know that, you know, kids tend to, at that age, tend, a lot of them, my son tends to rescind into his own sort of room and whatnot. And that's, you know, my son is a big one and the challenge of, of communication with him. So that's, that's very much part of it, you know, and then the other things are when my father passed away, you know, I have a very deep, very, very deep spiritual belief in God, not in the traditional sense, my own way through my beliefs and the things I, I feel, but I very, very, very thankful that my family and friends are there and I'm able to communicate with them and apologize. You know, I was able, I have, I've been able to apologize to so many people that stuck through it with me to include obviously my mother and my sister, my son, my close friends that still were able to stay around. You know, like I know we have a kind of a mutual friend, like in Matt Vincent, like Matt saved my life. You know, him, Jen Wiederstrom, Derek Woodski, people like that legitimately saved my life. And that's my, I have friends, you know, Dana Santos was, was there for me. And the list goes on and on of people that, that were really for no, <laughs> I always tell people like my lifestyle was like akin to me wearing this huge robe, I guess we'll call it. And that long tail at the bend of the robe is, it was filled full of just my own garbage. So I had all my friends around that long tail of like helping me carry this garbage around. And I was always looking back thinking, well, they're my friends. I'll keep carrying my garbage. You'll keep dealing with my garbage. And eventually I turned around and all I saw was my son carrying all that shit. And I was like, that's got to change, you know? And now, now I, now I like, I like being that person that my friends will call and say, Hey man, I've got an issue. What do you think I should do? And it never misses my heart when I realize the gravity of that when somebody that that trusts you, that really trusts you, is calling for your advice and something that makes them happy, sad. Like, you know, the fact that I'm afforded that time and that opportunity to impact that life to me is it's beyond words, you know, and. I do. I do on a regular basis. You know, once or twice a month, I get a phone call or an email, right? Not really a phone call at this point because I know my phone number isn't out there, but I get an email or a direct message about, hey, so and such, you know, I tried to kill myself. I had someone DM me, like, it's now a very good friend of me that was like, yeah, I tried to kill myself and check myself into a hospital. You know, I listened to some of your podcasts and whatnot. And I just, I was like, well, if this person's willing to be that vulnerable, and literally say, hey, man, I just checked myself in the hospital because I'd kill myself. I think it's worth my time for me to call and just see who that, see who that stranger is. You know, yeah. so, man, like, I never would have been in a position to give or even listen. And now, now that's the thing. It's like surround myself with friends and family that I really want to hear about, you know. And that's been a big, big change for me. Jeff, there's thousands, if not millions of men and, and women leaving the military, leaving you know, policing, leaving even professional sports and, and maybe not the same level of, of commitment, but still trying to transition from one very, very focused, one very particular type of life into a new one. What would you say to those people who are trying to make a shift like what were the biggest difference makers for your transition out of the military yeah there's a couple points i definitely would would ask people to to begin thinking about right if you're single when you get out of the military the first thing i would do is establish yourself in, in a, i'm saying community as a general term find something to begin to in, interact with human beings in a place in a space that is healthy that is consistent it's reproducible, that's reliable. Okay. That's important. You know, and I think that's where the physicality, those gym spaces are regardless of what genre of, of physical fitness, right? Biking, CrossFit, powerlifting, bodybuilding, whatever it may be. Right. There's a lot of other things, but we'll just use that as an example. That's very important. Socialization is very important in my belief. Also right there, that is a sense of spirituality. Uh, may not necessarily be church, but I think that there's a sense of spirituality that needs to be addressed because we have a lot of time in our head, especially for those people that are really low. That's where you're at. You're living in your head. And 
if you don't practice living in that space in a healthy way before you're going to lose yourself, you will, you know, I've been down that road and tried to kill myself a few times on purpose and not on purpose a few times with heroin and some things. So, you know, I, I think that that was a big part for me was, was I wasn't comfortable being in my own head space because I hadn't really learned how to navigate it because I spent so much time in that objective classroom, if you will. So I think finding spirituality is super important. Surround yourself with people that you care for in, in a community, like find a community space. And I think another thing too is with that, I think pursuit of things worth pursuing are very, very necessary, especially for those that are leaving that very severe fraternity, if you will. I think that especially for those those people that are in the military and law enforcement and fire and they don't see themselves making a career out of it, that's the perfect opportunity to begin finding interest in other places. You know, maybe you go back to school, maybe you do those things. But I think lacking a plan is a really bad idea. And a lot of times just that plan before you can find those social spaces you're comfortable with and surround yourself with new people that you, you haven't met yet, you know, the layman's sort of statement is going to be pursue what you love, and not at the expense of anything, you know, not the expense of your health and wellness and other people, but really down deep, find something that you're passionate about and you love and you care about. And, and understand this, it may change and that's okay, right? There may be some transitional things that you're like, well, this is not my ultimate profession, but right now I enjoy this. Fine. Like, you know, maybe you're a personal trainer before, you know, while you're finishing school part-time with the green exercise science or, or whatever, like pursuit of what makes your heart move is worthy of your time. Not that's super important in, in, in terms of my advice, I think. Yeah. So in, you travel around the world doing talks to corporations and people getting them inspired, et cetera, and, and maybe giving them direction. And you talk a lot about purpose. Any advice to people out there who are having a hard time finding their purpose? Yeah, I think that's where spirituality and discovery, I think, kind of lend themselves a doorway. And also with people, like that's what all these are is it's a bit of social engineering, right? And purposes can always change. They can evolve. And that really, I think, is a direct correlation to where people are in their lives. I think it's interesting that we as a civilization tend to expect 18-year-olds to have the idea of exactly what they're going to do and what career you're going to do and what major you're going to major in, all those sort of things. And I think that that's where military service law enforcement offers a very unique thing is people do plenty of people, and it's totally fine, join the military after they leave high school because they don't know what they're going to do. Fine, right? As long as we are productively working, like in that military service law enforcement, you get out and do something, fine. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I think I think that we're really hard on ourselves as a society to pick something and stick to it. Because if you change your mind, you're an asshole or a hypocrite. And I think that that's a big, bad message, like a really bad message that we're sending. It's like, if you're changing your mind because your heart isn't in it, then you are doing all of us a service. Because the last thing I need is, you know, like I'm going to go get my oil changed or whatever it may be, anything, right? Again, I don't want to have to deal with somebody that really hates what they're doing and then I'm expecting them to provide a service. So I think that that's really important. We, we've, we've bypassed the decision-making and that it's okay to change your mind. So that's what I think. I think get on the path, a purposeful path, even if it's short-term, because a lot of times those purposeful paths, especially the short-term ones, will lead us to a long-term path that is sustainable and full of passion and compassion. So don't be in a big damn hurry to solve your life in 18 months, right? There's enough life to live in this planet where we can give ourselves enough enough rope, I guess you will, to start working on what we want to do. I just, maybe that's easy for me to say at this point in the game, but as I look back and audit my life, it's like my achievement, whatever that means to anyone and myself, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be right now. I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And the path and that process, it's only as valuable as the purpose. Because if you're not driven to do it, then you're just kind of just walking in circles as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge that. I think it's important for people to know that once you find that thing that you would that you do, 
with absolute purpose and passion, it becomes so easy that it happens really fast, right? So it seems like you've made a massive shift in your life in a really short amount of time because you find this massively transformative purpose and, and, and just it just opens up and it feels like you wake up every day super early with so much energy and so much focus and, and this you know relentless desire to you know pursue your mission, I guess. And I think people sometimes panic. They're like, oh, I don't want to change my job. I don't want to stop doing this. I don't want to stop doing that because you know, I'm getting older now or you know, I, I don't want to leave my comfort zone. And a lot of people are, you know, broken down or beaten down this this helpless dog syndrome right the idea of like you know people just don't feel like they're capable after a while and i think it's important for people to know once you find that thing that lights your soul on fire what i would call your dharma man it's just life opens up and you know the skies are always blue and you wake up in the morning and it's just like i'm so thankful that i'm alive and get to live this life and get to help the people i am and live this dream that i'm living and want everyone listening to know that it's absolutely possible, Jeff. And it's so great to hear that you found at least this step in your Dharma, this step in your journey. And I'm sure there's going to be so many more, so much value that you're providing to the world. Man, I think it's really unique that you and I connected on this because I think we're in very similar places and you've got so much to offer the world when it comes to exercise as well. So you've got this purpose now to help not just people who are coming out of the military, but people going into the military as well. And, and just people in general get healthy and fit. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, I think for me, it is that it's that it's that purposeful process. And when I evaluated my approach, I said, I've been a strength coach now, this is my 20th year as a strength coach. I was a strength coach in college years ago, at Troy University. And it taught me a lot, the evolution of my, me as a coach through the time in the military as a strength coach and an active duty SEAL is a very interesting perspective. And then when I get out, you know, I realized there's a real underservicing to a lot of these populations. So my heart, like really my heart is in that population. My heart really desires for these people to have information available to them, access in the same way that, you know, like I'm a sniper, I'm a master breacher, I'm all these things, I have all these qualifications that the military has taught me. The process in which I learned these very finite skills, they be become lifelong skills. I could take the rifle that I have in my safe, one of them, it's an exact, not even a replica, remaking of the sniper rifle that I had by the exact same gun maker. So my point is, is I could take that gun, I could take it to any range in the world, and I could shoot it as if I was at sniper school. Point is, I learned it. And that's the big takeaway for these populations, I think, is that not, you know, Certainly not everyone that goes down that path is going to retire in service in that, in that aptitude. But the vast majority, the vast majority of people in the special operations program, even if they're going to do it for six, eight, 10, I did it only for 11 years, the vast majority of those individuals are in there are consuming that finite information because they want to. They really, really give a damn. And with, with respect to sport and other things, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time in, in professional athletics and various capacities, and that desire to be there is not commensurate to what I've seen in the military space. I just I see a lot of skill and talent in the pro side, and that's why they do it. Even though you know they can find some passion and love, and I'm my, by no means trying to marginalize professional athletes' desire to play the sport. That's not at all what I'm doing. I just recognize maybe because my heart is so close to that demographic of the tactical space. Like I just, I really see this population that wants this information. Like they really desperately do. They love their job. They find pride in their job. Their family finds pride in their job. They are a pillar of their community in that sense. And I want to empower them with ways that they can look their wife and the child in the eye and go, you know what? This may not save my life. But this is going to give me an advantage over the people that want to do harm to me. And I think of no better way to empower, you know, a demographic of people. There's something to be said, and I know that you can probably relate to the statement. There is something to be said about being physically imposing, but using it in a way that, you know, I think I'd like to get your take on this at some point where it's like you run into a total stranger in a public setting. And they are probably extremely surprised about how articulate you are, right? You know, you're an extremely intelligent human being with a very unique athletic background that makes you look a certain way. 
right? I'm covered head to toe in tattoos. Like I have this for a long time, long hair and a beard. And then when I open my mouth, people are like, this guy's actually really friendly and, and well-read or whatever it is. And like that, that to me is the ploy. And I think that a lot of the tactical population is served well by that. Hey, I want you to be not physically imposing, but have a physical presence. And then when you open your mouth, you're educated, you're articulate, you're concise, right? And I think that that physical presence really plays well into that. So, you know, it really comes down to, simply put, it's, I, I really do feel like physical achievement to some degree, even if it's just becoming more optimally mobile, if you want to call it that, or just, hey, I'm experiencing less pain, less discomfort, right? And then we can go, you know, go obviously go down the very important road of sleep and, and dietetics is like really kind of, I usually don't fiddle with someone's training until I know that like they're working on their sleep or their dietetics are starting to gain, uh, gain improvement. But for me, that's not my, you know, I'm, I'm choosing the one lane and trying to do that one lane very well. So for me, again, I just really, I feel deeply inside that these people want to learn. You know, and, and the feedback I've gotten back has been, you know, honestly, Ben, I, I never really thought I could truly monetize what I do unless I'm like physically in person, right? How do I really impact this population? And again, I kind of really did follow a lot of what you've done, the sense of like, you know, they can only have so much Ben Pakalski in person. And some people are very fortunate to have that. But what do you do is, you know, you're putting out programming, but you're also... You have, you're putting out videos like, Hey, this is how you should move. This is how we optimally stress out the bicep, right? By holding this, doing, explaining to them at a level that they're going, the consumer in the tactical space, they want to know what the best scope on the rifle is, not just any scope. So if I'm telling a tactical operator, like, Hey, this is how we can best minimize some of these injuries, but it's best how we can support you wearing body armor all the time. We're train this, train this, train that, and this is the why. And I think that that's what they're looking for is that population of upper echelon athletes or executives or it may be, the why is equally as important as the how. And that's my ploy is, is just, hey, if you want to know why, listen. And that's fine. That's a deeper dive. If you need to know how, here it is. This is it. This is the how. And if you need to know the why, here's a little bit more information on the why. And that's my real goal right now is to get as much information I can out there that's accessible for that population that really want to improve. Right. So you've got a huge audience of male listeners and obviously some females as well. But what would be some of the biggest takeaways from your time in special forces and military that you would say, hey, I think everyone listening to this podcast should be doing this. And it could be one thing or three things or what are the big, big rocks that you would say, hey, guys, like, here's something you're not paying attention to that has the greatest opportunity to shift your life? Yeah, that's, man, it, it'd be a bit of a toss up probably either between, honestly, it wouldn't even necessarily be about training initially. Like I said, my first conversation with somebody is probably going to be about sleep in, in order to, right, begin to help manage stressors. And that's the big one I saw you know, when it, in the history where I've consulted for different, different organizations, that's usually the, that, that is the first sort of piece of curriculum is like, listen, if you're showing up to only four hours of sleep, expecting to be optimal, well, here are the reasons why you are wrong. And I tell those people all the time too. And I think I've heard you say this before too. It's like, I live and work within the population with the biggest ego. Like that's what I do. And my job is to tell them they're doing things wrong. So that's a real interesting thing. And, I'm trying to tell people like that's gone through buds and the selection processes, whatever it is, and going, hey, you've done this wrong. And they look at you and they go, whoa, 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 whoa. Like what got me here is what got me here. And that's why I'm successful because there is that fear of change. And so I think that that's where I would start with is understanding the importance of sleep, how that directly correlates, you know, and affects your digestion. We'll just say that and your, your uptake of, of nutrients. And then the spillover is like, well, if you really want to train as hard as you can because you love to train, well, I think we should probably start with your sleep. And then from sleep, I talk dietetics and dietetics, then it goes into the, the training. So really focusing the importance, really, again, just getting past the buzz information of not being precise. You know, I, I hated the fact that we're like, 
you know, we, we can very admittedly say that we have put human beings on the moon. Uh, some people would disagree with that, the flat earthers and whatnot. But the fact that we put human beings on the moon in like the late 60s, but yet we're still arguing that you can't precisely coach or determine the optimal function of a back squat, barbell back squat. Like it's, it's beyond me. The fact that we're trying to still argue or, or stipulate, well, this is how the muscles work. And then somebody goes, well, that's not how I learned it. I'm like, okay, got it. And that, that conversation dies. So I think that that's the thing is, and actually, I was actually listening to, I rarely listen to the radio. Last night, I was actually listening to the radio and it was, they were talking just about how people in general are just, just so unwilling to change because of the fact that it creates insecurity, you know? And I think that, and that topic right there and that whole idea is that people go, yeah, I've gotten four hours of sleep. Well, that ain't nothing. I, I'm working on two, almost like it's a badge of honor and it's, it's pure ignorance and trying to change that dialogue about sleep of like, well, yeah, you've got four hours of sleep. Why? That's ridiculous. You know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And it's not a badge of honor, figuratively or, you know, literally in that sense of lacking of sleep and still saying, hey, I can, I can do all these great things. Because yeah, no kidding. Like, I'm a perfect example. And so many people have a perfect example for so many years where you can abuse the human body for decades. And all we're doing is relying on its resiliency. But at some point, the resiliency comes to an end. And that is a thing that Instead of using that scare tactic, essentially what people perceive it as is you just start creating dialogue on the importance of sleep and, and how you can empower them. And it's like not huge changes, right? Make small changes, make small changes, and that's it. And before you know it, there's a real value that's objectively measured. And you know, sleep for me is a huge priority. Um, the quality of sleep obviously is, is in there too, but sleep trumps everything as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, the subconscious mind is is a big player in sleep and getting your mind to turn off and, and that subconscious programming that's kind of always running seems to be the biggest deterrent, at least in, in most communities, of helping people or allowing people to get to sleep and stay asleep because their mind just won't turn off. And I'm going to speculate, Jeff, I don't know you all that well, but I'm going to speculate you probably have more aggressive subconscious programming than probably most human beings will ever experience. And that's me being speculative. So please correct me if I'm wrong, just simply based on your military background and, and the aggressive nature of that you say your, your personality was. If that is the case, I'd love to hear some of your interventions or your approaches to start getting the unconscious subconscious mind to release and allow you to actually get into sleep. I can kind of give you a bit of a summary. So uh, there's there's two there's two people in particular that I'm very very fond of. One is Dr. Shona Halson. She's a director of sleep and recovery for the Australian Institute of Sport and has been for years. What's her last name? Halson. Shona Halson. H A L S O N. And the other one is Dr. John Sullivan. He was a sports psychologist for the Patriots for like 14 years. All a bunch of European soccer. The list goes on and on. Long and the short is those two individuals were brought in as consultants for this very thing the command that I left the military and understanding so much about the importance of sleep and, you know, deep dive, but really it's kind of simply put as this, the two of them were, were posing questions to me and they're like, okay, so you've got a child at the time. Yeah, I certainly had a child. My son at the time was like three years old and he's like, and they were like, okay, well, do you let your child, your child's room be lit, well lit when they're trying to sleep? And I'm like, no. It's like, would you put, let them stay in a wet diaper? Nope. When they go to bed, what do you feed them? They're like breast milk or formula probably, right? And he's like, yeah, why is that? You know, you go on there like, what is casein? What are all these sort of slow digesting amino rich acid, you know, amino acid rich proteins? Yada, yada. You start going, okay, how does a pediatrician recommend us adults treat our children? And like, how closely are you living that lifestyle or in slumber? Right? Are you prepping your room as you would like, hey, you're going to go out on this combat mission. Have you gone out without checking your radio or magazines? That's it's absurd. Have you not prepared? It's like, are you staging yourself in your bedroom as if it's your purpose is to sleep? Right? It's like it got to the point now where I don't chew mint gum, I don't eat mint ice cream, I don't do anything mint. Mint to me is sleep. It's my toothpaste. Right? 
what I've done is I've conditioned myself that my bedroom is for two things. Right? The bed specifically is for sex and for sleeping, and that is it. Occasionally, I'll read. I read from the Bible and some things, but that's become part of my process, right? In the same way that LeBron James, that Bryce Harper, that who probably even you, specifically me, every time I grab a bar, I make sure that I'm in, I say, get in my starting blocks, make sure I'm in a position to produce force in my desired manner. Sleep is that. Sleep is a stimulus. Sleep is no different in terms of the brain's assimilation of X's and O's of a computer system. Right? It's processing needs platform to be cathartic. It needs that, right? We need a cool, dry place. We need to have, right? we don't want to be sleeping in certain things. We don't want a lot of noise and excess. There's a lot of things that we can prepare. And so that's what I do. When it's time for me to sleep, the process begins, right? And then that process, then once you're refining your house, you can deviate it from some at times. But then you know, what I've done is I've created deviation when I'm on the road, you know, especially when I was sleeping so terribly, you know, I, and I started making, you know, doing things in a hotel room, like a lot of hotels I stayed in were in very dry climates. So I'd take a wet towel and I'd not sopping wet, I'd put it on the air, air conditioner, right? It'd humidify the room and I'd unplug all the electronics in the hotel, all of them, right? And, and move them away from my bed. Like I went to this extreme. So now I'm kind of come back and like I... My phone is, you know, eight feet away or so from my head. I have a CPAP, but otherwise there's no electronics that's even visible from the bed. So what I like to tell people is pretend that you're an adult. <laughs> pretend that you're a parent if you're not already. And treat yourself as if you were to treat your two-year-old toddler before you go to bed. And that for me has been one of those good conversations that I can have with parents. And people go, huh. I never really thought about that. It's like, why are you? Because then people are like, well, yeah, but you're telling me to sleep nine hours a night, Jeff. I go, no, no, no. Nine hours does not precede quality four, right? Let's work on the quality of the sleep environment, right? Before we start saying quantity, because if quantity is the focus, we have just turned sleep in its own point of stress. So I, I think that people need to have this conversation and they go, huh, I've already kind of got my own little process. I'm like, yes. You take a hot shower probably, you brush your teeth, you get into bed, and you have your process. And that's all we're talking about is create a process that's sustainable, it's reliable, it's reproducible, and can be taught. And those are my four rules when it comes to sleep, dietetics, and training. And a lot of people then typically don't tend to be too overwhelmed by starting a new process. And after a few weeks, they come back and go, well, I'm still not sleeping the length of time that I'd like. But my sleep quality really has improved. And that, that right there is incredibly valuable as far as I'm concerned. It's funny how we tend to talk a lot about it. But yeah, when it comes down to doing it ourselves, we often don't. And I think most adults are guilty of that. Like, you know, most people know the value of sleep, but they're just like, oh, you know, I have all these other things to do. And, and maybe they'll, like you say, prioritize their children's sleep and they'll be very insistent that the children get to sleep, but certainly neglect themselves. And I was like that for many years, the, the martyr, right? Like I'll put everyone else's needs before mine and you know, I'll stay up as late as necessary to get things done and I'll you know, make sure that, that things are put in place and you start neglecting yourself. It's very easy to do that. So it's great advice to start thinking about like how would you treat your children and, and would you let your children stay up late is a great question to ask and absolutely tremendous value there. And I think people should absolutely take notice of your direction. And I think you and I are going to have some more talks on this stuff in the future on how we can help a greater population of people. And, and there's certainly a massive amount of overlap. And you know, the reason I created the six pillars of lean, healthy, and muscular physique is just to simplify it. Because you know, a lot of times I am talking to people like your demographic and uh, given the simple jumping off points is I think an absolute necessary piece to body, mind, and life optimization. Like giving people a framework is absolutely imperative. So thank you for creating that for us and for our listeners. And I'd love to for you to tell us where we can find more from you. Yeah, I'm pretty, I guess I'm pretty easy to track down my social media platform. The only one I've got is Instagram. It's uh, Jeff CSCS. And then my website, performancefirstus.com. From that, there you go. Again, I've, I've really have, <laughs> I have my membership website in very similar regards to you where it has my you know, it actually has more of a Rolodex of like I'm dumping videos on there constantly. Cause at one point 
I had a YouTube channel. I still do, I guess. But I had like almost 300 videos on there. And I just, you know, from a business standpoint, I wanted to possess that stuff. So which that's why it now all resides on my website and the membership side. And, you know, if you have questions, send them from the website. And we're pretty good. I say we, my, my better half, my much better half, my business manager, my girlfriend, she's amazing. And she really handles so much of the business side with her 20 years of experience of managing this stuff. And now she's tasked with <laughs> trying to corral this, this person. So, you know, we're really very vigilant about what we do. And as a matter of fact, at noon, we are looking at a building to expand the business. So, you know, it's one of those things, not in a big darn hurry to do, but I really, really enjoy what I do. And I like the interaction with people. So... Yeah, I very much look forward to the future and whatever that I do and engaging with you and other other professionals that I very deeply respect. And, you know, as, as, as far as that goes, you know, there's, I've been on a fair number of podcasts. I've known some of them that you and I have not ever met, but I can say with respect to you and the people that you impact on a daily basis, let it be said that you have greatly positively impacted my life not to and, and to include the people that you've had on your podcast. So I very much can you know want to thank you specifically for your time and your efforts and, and what you do because they give me a beacon and a pulse. You know, like I'm not the only person out there that deeply believes in taking care of ourselves and others in the capacity in the pulpit that we have. So to you Ben, I, I, I want to thank you and I appreciate you for your time and your hospitality and, and the way that you show other people love and, and know in compassion so thank you for that thank you so much jeff i appreciate that and, and i look forward to meeting Catherine because she sounds like an absolutely wonderful lady and, and hopefully we all get to connect some time and get some great lifting in and get a great meal and, and i'm sure there's certainly some collaborations in the future as it seems like there's definitely some parallels man so i'm super grateful for your time and even our chat before our chat was absolutely fantastic and i look forward to connecting again in the future jeff thanks again for your time you betcha All right, ladies and gents, boys and girls, thanks for tuning in. Again, grateful for you. Thank you for being here. We're all on our journey, and Jeff Nichols gives us incredible insight into how to get through some stuff. We're all going to go through stuff, and you shouldn't want to not go through stuff, right? We don't want it to be easy. We want to be stronger. That's always the objective is you know, when you feel yourself taking the easy road, slap yourself and say, hey, no, the easy road never leads to easy long term, right? We always pick. I always used to say is this simple idea of either you pick your discipline or someone else is going to pick it for you. You pick your obstacles and your challenges or someone else will pick it for you. So I highly suggest that we intentionally subject ourselves to discipline and obstacles and challenges and growth. Because if you pick the easy road, at some point, it's going to catch up to you. We're all ascending a mountain and it's one step, two steps, three steps in the right direction every day. And if you decide to not ascend the mountain today, at some point you're going to have to catch up or someone's going to pay the piper. Yeah, I hope you, you guys love the podcast. I hope you love this mission of helping everyone live their greatest life in a body they love around the six pillars. And don't forget to check out bubsnaturals.com and use the code intelligence for 20% off. BPAC signing off from Bali. Have an amazing day. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.